Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And we wanted to talk a little bit about a... Well, you know what? We just wanted to talk about Kickstarter today. I wanted to lead into it in some fancy way, but uh, we are a few years past kind of the peak of Kickstarter being this mecca of all of great ideas can come from there. And we're starting to see... Well, we've been seeing games that have failed to deliver, games that have delivered, games that are taking a little while to deliver, and we're we're kind of seeing the truth of the matter, I suppose. Yeah, uh, crowdfunding has been a thing that's been around for quite some time at this point, uh, and there are multiple sites, but Kickstarter is still, I think, the flagship site, the main site that does it. You know, there are others, you know, Indiegogo and, and Drip and some other stuff. Uh, but Kickstarter, I think, is like the launching point for all of it. And so a lot of video games that wanted to find a new life outside of proper industry support went to Kickstarter. And some have been very successful. Um, I believe Shovel Knight started on Kickstarter, didn't it? Yes, it did, as yeah. well as Undertale. And, you know, the, the these are all games that have come out. And there are games that are still coming out, uh, you know, Bloodstained famously start, is on Kickstarter and has had some struggles, but is finally coming out this summer, at least according to the most recent Nintendo Direct, so yes. we'll see how true that is. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to look at this landscape. I mean, and it's not even just for video games. Kickstarter has been a great supporter of board games as well. Um, I know a ton of game designers who have gone to Kickstarter, I guess for, for basic knowledge of those who may have never heard the word Kickstarter before, which is unlikely that you're listening to this podcast and don't know, but just in case, Kickstarter is a, a crowdfunding site where you can set tiers and generate support, direct support from fans for a project you want to work on. And so with video games, it's been very much a, you know, you pay X amount of money, you get the game, but we get your money in advance so we can use it to actually make the game instead of relying on the chance of possibly you buying the game. And the, m most of those games, if not all of them, go on retail, sell as well, but they try and generate enough buzz and money beforehand so they can have the resources to make these games. And even if a project is successfully funded, doesn't mean the game will be a success. Um, one of the most famous cases is Mighty Number no. 9, which is created by the original creator of Mega Man. And it was, there was so much buzz around it. People were so excited for it. It looked like old school Mega Man games. And then it came out and like too much text. It ran really slow. The story was bad. You know, the gameplay was janking, bad voiceover. And it, it was a shock because so many people were looking forward to that game. And of course, then a few years later, Capcom released Mega Man 11 almost with like a thumb up, a thumb at their nose because, you know, that was a better game. It was a Mega Man game. Where's this Mighty Number no. 9 was supposed to be the new Mega Man and failed to deliver. Yeah, and I, it can be said that the, uh, that the release of Mega Man 11 was sort of brought out because of the disappointment of Mighty Number no. 9. And seeing, yeah. oh, there's interest in a Mega Man game. Well, we've got the license. Let's just make another good Mega Man game. Well, all, all right then. And it's very interesting to see all of the myriad little ways that uh, Kickstarters can go about raising their money. Because, yes, the funding tiers that people put into their Kickstarters. Usually, if you're buying a retail version of the game through a Kickstarter you're paying a little more than retail. Yeah. But with the knowledge that you are helping this this go through, you are uh, eliminating a lot of middlemen. You you are now the middleman and you are benefiting from it. As well as they'll try to put in little uh, bonuses or there are things like stretch goals. And certainly since Kickstarter's big heyday of funding games was probably around 2011, 2012, uh, I think around when Double Fine did their Kickstarter. Yes. And that became very noteworthy, is raising, I think, like $3 million. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and from there it was like, oh, man, even big companies can go and make these things happen. And, uh, Matt, you mentioned board games, and I think there is a big difference in board games being funded on Kickstarter versus video games because... When you want to get a board game funded, you usually have a rule set. You usually have an idea of what you want to do. But getting all of the custom pieces, making uh, commissioning art, 
those are what you need to do. I mean, hell, I've created some board games, but I don't have the components to make them nice. Right. So you can go, all right, well, if I, I've now priced out what it would cost to get all these things done, well, that's my goal. Here we go. So a lot of times board game and tabletop game, card game, uh, Kickstarters are more, for lack of a better term, successful in that they deliver. Whereas video games, a lot of time, it's they're doing their crowdfunding a lot earlier in the development cycle. And there are a lot of uh, pieces that can go wrong. And even, I mean, it, it's almost a classic thing of, you know, don't necessarily fund a Kickstarter that's somebody's first game. But yeah. as you mentioned, Mighty Number no. 9, KG and Afune, you're like, how, how could this be bad? There was that uh, strategy game from a while ago that uh, Matsuno, the developer uh, or the director of Final Fantasy Tactics, they were going to be making a, uh, a new tactics game. Like, how can this be bad? Well, it uh, never really came out. Yeah, I mean, the big problem with Kickstarter, it, I think, is that once the once the project's funded, if you're not given regular updates, it's hard to know what's going on. Um, <laughs> that said, a lot of games I've played over the last two to three years, especially indie games or games on Steam and the Switch, started on Kickstarter. I mean, a lot of WayForward's games started on Kickstarter. I think they're running on their own Steam now, but like the Shantae series has had many Kickstarter iterations. Both of the Divinity games started on um, Kickstarter, yes. so did the new Shadowrun game. Um, uh, Torment Tides of Numenera. Yeah. Pillars of Eternity. And, and it's funny to me because as someone who doesn't really, I'm not a part of the Kickstarter culture. I just, I, it's not a thing that I really got invested in. And I guess I don't have an investor mentality, which is perfectly fine. I've bought a lot of these games after the fact, but I didn't realize quite how many of them had gotten their start or their uh, boost on Kickstarter. I mean, even the Pathfinder Kingmaker game, which recently came out, that was on Kickstarter, the Friday the 13th game, Battle Chasers. These are all games that have had so much buzz and have been doing really well. The Banner Saga games. That's right, yeah. All of them started on Kickstarter, and it's really... Even, ooh, even the new Hyperlight Drifter. The new... Uh, not the new, but the recently released yes. Hyperlight Drifter was also on Kickstarter. And I guess it's just really interesting to me how many indie developers have found a home here but it makes perfect sense when you don't have a giant corporation like Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo backing you. It makes sense to go to Kickstarter. And what has happened now on the other end is companies like Nintendo and Xbox. I think Sony also, but Nintendo and Xbox has been more uh, vocal about it. They're really supporting the indie game scene and putting money into it and promoting it and going out of their way to like uplift these indie developers who a lot of them started on Kickstarter. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, I imagine larger companies wouldn't necessarily be supporting their stuff like, well, let's see some work from you. Well, now we've seen some work, and it's and a lot of it is really good. And there are a lot of different ways to go about this development cycle. I mean, I don't remember how long it took from, for Shovel Knight to go from crowdfunding to release, but they hit a lot of stretch goals. So many stretch goals. The reason why there have been two with a third expansion uh, imminent as of this recording is because they had stretch goals for that. And it was like, all right, you can now, we've already designed these characters. Here's Shovel Knight. Here's the Order of No Quarter, the bad guys, very Mega Man style. Um, pick some of the members of the Order of No Quarter to have their own games in this world. All right, you've picked those. We're going to work on those. Come out when they do. <laughs> yeah, we're still waiting on King of Cards, which I believe comes out this year, finally. I think it does, as as well as they decided to make that fighting game out of Shovel yep. Knight. Yep, and which... I, yeah. I mean, and all of that coming as part of the Treasure Trove, which is the, the full package of game, mm -hmm. the fact that they're... And at a reasonable price makes really a lot of sense, and you can probably thank the Kickstarter backers for that affordability, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even a game like to the new Toe Jam and Earl that's coming out uh, in a few weeks from now, actually, uh, in the, I think the first week of March, that was kickstarted and that didn't hit a ton of stretch goals. But it's still like they still worked on it. It's still coming out. And I think what's interesting here is that 
hitting all those stretch goals and going above and beyond is great. But even games that don't, if they just get funded, they still they still happen. Yeah, you know. And it's and it's really interesting to watch that progression. Like we, me, and you have nerded out about Bloodstain many times because we love the two D pregame that came out. I think last year, the final game has been kind of in darkness for the last six months until the end of last year, where they said, "Oh, well, we're unfortunately have to restructure the Kickstarter. We had to drop these platforms and like refocus," and that's disappointing. But all the same. That it's still coming out. It's still being made. I think they're offering refunds to the people who bought for a platform that's now long, no longer being developed for. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing saying that they won't develop for it later. I think what also Kickstarter has helped be is a stepping stone that once the game is out and it does well, they can release it on other platforms. I mean, that's what happened with Ukulele. Ukulele didn't see an, uh, a Switch port until a year or so after it came out, maybe more. But because they had such success with the other platforms, they were able to make that other port happen. And if you supported the game on Kickstarter, they always knew they were going to do a Switch or Wii U version uh, at the time of the Kickstarter. They still offered that. They still allowed you to get that benefit from the Kickstarter campaign, even though it came out so much later. Yeah, it it really is a lot about promises kept and, and management of expectations. I, I was just double checking, and yet yeah, a bloodstain did go dark-ish, but they never they've been doing monthly updates ever since the Kickstarter was, was successfully funded. Yeah, I I am somebody that uh, crowdfunded the game to get a Wii U release, and fortunately I have a Switch and and uh, moved it on to that. But even when things were like okay, they're not giving us a lot of updates here, they were still sending out a monthly update. So there was still the fact that, okay, this is coming out. We are working on it. It will be done. And the fact that Curse of the Moon came out was very nice and very placating. But it also raised everyone's fervor for the main game to come out. Would we be still like, oh, when's it going to come out? If Curse of the Moon hadn't come out, I don't know. But it is sort of an inverse of the Shovel Knight situation where they're like, all right, well, we finished the stretch goal. So here you go. That is done. This is this can come out whenever it is done. It's a it's an interesting situation as far as that goes. Yeah, I, I guess what I meant by go dark is about the thing everyone cared about, which was the release date. Okay, you know, that's true. No, that's true. You got me there. They, they they were cagey about that for a while, but it made sense. You know, they just they didn't want to provide information they didn't actually have. So the fact that the most recent Nintendo Direct, as of when we're recording announced that it's coming out this summer, even though we don't have a specific date yet, is a good sign. And I hope it holds to that because I loved the 2D game and I'm really excited about, you know, the 2D plus game that's coming out, this this really beautiful looking full fledged game. And so I want I want to play it, you know. But that I think that's another part that's kind of a problem with the Kickstarter generation of gaming is that you don't when you Kickstarter a game, you have no obligation to give a hard release date. Zero. Yeah. You just have to promise that the game's coming out, um, and the and all to get the money, all you have to do is successfully fund it. And so, if you successfully fund a game and don't give a release date, you know, even if you give a projected one, th- there's nothing as far as I know that Kickstarter can do about it. You just kind of have to wait, right, and see what happens. And a lot of games can take. A lot of time to to develop, and it, it can be difficult to to exactly say. Well, sure, and I think you know the gaming industry is no stranger to pushback and delays. I mean, the fact that Bloodstain got delayed didn't surprise me at all. Right, and and I just look at it as, and it's hard as a gamer, as someone who wants the content to to be happy about delays. But I've always looked at it as. You know, they're just making the game better. They're taking more time because they want it to be a better game, Mm -hmm. you know. And I think um, certainly with larger or more known developers that then go the indie route, there is something that is run into where this is something I don't think we've talked about in any in any great detail. And today is not the day to go super deep, but maybe we'll do later. The idea that we put a lot of of onus, a lot of praise, a lot of blame on sing singular shoulders for the the success or failure of a game 
whether it's uh, Hideo Kojima for the Metal Gear series, whether it's Inafune for, you know, Mega Man or, or, or the like. Um, there are a lot of circumstances and a lot of factors that go into the circumstances of how a game is made. And I don't know this for certain, but I can imagine that developers, directors, designers that worked for larger companies and made projects within the constraints of that company who then can make a lawyer-friendly knockoff of like something that they made that, that was beloved, now they're outside of those constraints. And whether it's a team that doesn't know how to properly edit or there's not the deadline looming or whatever it is, you can run into some difficulties. So that, this also tempers my expectations of Bloodstained. While I am a huge fan of like Egavania, the Metroidvania style games, I love them to tears. It's like yeah. I, if they're running into some delays and they're bringing the fact that they were bringing in extra people on this, I'm actually very excited about that because it's like okay, now we've got some good back and forth. Yeah, I think that in the modern gaming scene, also everything's way more transparent than it used to be. Like as a kid, I remember. I don't remember when I started chasing release dates. I think it wasn't until the PlayStation generation, maybe PlayStation 2 generation, like that iteration of game consoles, mm -hmm. that I actually actively started pursuing release dates, probably with games like Kingdom Hearts and things like that, where I knew games were coming out and was waiting for games. Right. But like in the Nintendo era and even the Super Nintendo era, like nobody paid attention to I mean, I won't say nobody, but it was a lot less. Uh, Not us kids. Yeah, I mean, the information was less known. If you got a Nintendo Power or an EGM or something like that, it would have game releases or, or you know, trailers for games, mm -hmm. uh, images and stuff. But beyond that, like, it was a lot harder to get granular with that information. Whereas now, with modern technology and, tra and expected transparency between Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and all sorts of social media... You're expected to know everything. I mean, we were talking about in the last episode, Shen, the new Shenmue game, which was Kickstartered. You know, a game that's been in development for God knows how long and has kind of been at least an idea for a very long time if it hasn't been in development and has still not come out yet and is still being worked on, to my knowledge. I think you know, so, yeah. It's just we know all of that because there's this expected transparency of delivering all this information. Whereas I don't think game developers had to be that transparent back in the day. I mean, I'm sure I'm almost positive Nintendo wasn't. You know, I feel like even in the the Wii generation, like that's when I first started tracking release dates for Zelda games and stuff. And it's like, oh, I have to wait this long. Oh, they're pushing it back again. What the hell? But also it became easier to get that information because GameStop became more common. Yes. And, you know, GameStop had before they had their high tech computer system, when it was Funko land, they had uh, lists of trade in values and lists of game releases, you know, and you would have to look up the thing you wanted. Oh yeah. And, and nowadays they, push those release dates on us a lot more at places like GameStop where it's like, hey, this game's coming out. Would you like to pre-order it? Would you like, you know, it's, you almost can't avoid release dates. Sure. And now all ads for games have release dates too. Every YouTube ad talks about when the game is coming out because they want people to pre-purchase and pre-order, especially since a lot of things are digital now. I mean, I've been seeing Anthem ads for the last six months to a year. And the game is finally coming out this month. You know, and I'm sure I'll still see the ads, except now it'll tell me it's out now instead of the fact that it was coming out. Um, I, I wasn't paying attention. I'm surprised Anthem isn't out yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think it's one, and that, that speaks, I think, to the ubiquity of the uh, advertising campaigns for some of these games. You know, whereas on the other hand, Crackdown 3 has been in development hell forever and just came out yesterday. And I didn't know until I saw a very delightful and hilarious ad featuring Terry Crews because he's the voice of the lead character uh. on Twitter just saying the game is out now. And I was like, oh, okay, uh, sure. You know, I don't own an Xbox and I don't have a Game Pass for the PC, so I, I can't play it at the moment anyway. But I just, I'd kind of forgotten that it was coming out because it had kind of faded from memory. Now that said, marketing is so hyper-specific my computer probably knows I don't own an Xbox One, so it's not advertising to me that nonsense. 
maybe who knows i i don't know i don't i don't want to get very tinfoil hat on that <laughs> and i know that there's all kinds of algorithms and people that can speak to this but if i try to speculate it's tinfoil hat yeah no that's legit but but what i'm saying is this idea of doing a kickstarter campaign and having to wait for the release of the game I also think it's kind of like a present to yourself from the past to the future. This idea that you invest in a game, you pay this money for it, and whenever it comes out, you'll have it. Like you don't you don't have to go out of your way to get it. You'll just get it because you invested so early on. Exactly. I've definitely look at these as times where like, well, I have the money to afford on this at this moment. Maybe I wouldn't when it comes out or maybe what or I'll be hemming and hawing about whether or not I want to get it when it comes out. You know what? And that was what it was with Bloodstained. I was like, it's sixty dollars. That is that is retail. So yeah. let me do that right now, and I'm gonna be so excited whenever it does come out. Uh, conversely, on that there is a Kickstarter that I recently did that I'm very excited about. That is sort of it, it's very different from this. I I uh, did a Kickstarter for a Kickstarter a game called Micro Mages. Which this is an, a completely different avenue of what, some of the Kickstarter stuff that happens. Um, have I told you about Micro Mages yet, Matt? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, if and if I did, it certainly wasn't on the podcast. So you know, for sure, it, it's not yeah. canon. Uh, <laughs> Micro Mages is an NES game. It was, and it is a new NES game that has been developed over the last few years. And when I say it's an NES game, the Kickstarter was to get a print run of NES cartridges. Wow. Yes, they they fully developed the game. And this this was sort of like what, what we were saying earlier, that it's like it is nebulous and difficult when you are doing a Kickstarter for a video game. It's usually pretty early in development because you want to be able to pay the right people to, to, to code it, to program it, to design it. But Micromages was something that they they wrote, they created, and everything else. And so... The, the Kickstarter was like, look, the game's done. And whatever you pay for this is going towards the printing of all of the instruction manuals, the full box, the everything that we've already designed. We just want to get you a version that you can play on an NES or NES cartridge playing apparatus. And it's, in fact, an up to four player game and one that fits on the original, like, sized cartridges because th this is the thing like you look at an nes cartridge and th they're all the same shape right but there are different sizes of uh disk space on it or storage memory right. and while uh you know a lot of homebrew games or whatever can use uh nes cartridges up to a massive 512 kilobytes of space this one, one of its big bragging points is that it fits on a 40 kilobyte uh, space, which is the size of the original NES launch titles. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, like, one of their advertising things is, like, Micromages could have been an NES launch title if we knew what we knew now then as far as being able to fit all of these things. Well, yeah, and there's actually quite a few of those on on Kickstarter as well. You mentioned this and it reminded me of 40 Winks, which is an yes. N64 game that was supposed to come out in 98 that got canceled. That is now out. That was now is now released because it got Kickstartered and it's an actual physical N64 cartridge. You can also, I think, get a digital version as well, but they actually backed it to make the actual cartridges. Yeah, and you can uh, and you can buy it now, I believe. Or you can yeah, pre you could pre-order it now. Yeah, I don't think it's it's released yet, but you can pre-order it now. Uh, it's available for pre-order. Um, but yeah, and so I think it's really interesting that it's a creative way to create new games because no no other publisher has ever wanted to do that. You know, they were re-released. We've talked about the remaster fad and the, the idea that plenty of companies want to make newer versions of old games for current consoles, but very few people want to make new games for older consoles which is like forcing a restriction which i think is really interesting i mean if you think about it i'm sure shovel knight probably could be an n64 game i don't think it could go back to super nintendo because even though it has the graphics i think the, it's the, the, the color palette 
the color palette, the size, the design, but it definitely could fit on an N64 cartridge. You know, and so the idea of companies wanting to do something like that, I think is really fascinating. This idea of purposely restricting yourself to live up to something. And also those kinds of things are directly geared to people like you, Jeff, who collects retro stuff because you have all of these retro systems that you're buying finger quotes, new to you games, games that are new to you that aren't necessarily new, but now there are people making new things for those old systems as well. Yeah. There's, and there are a handful of companies that are, I don't want to say like regularly doing it, but are notable for like, okay, they're coming out with a bunch of stuff like people like mega cat studios as well off the top of my head. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of nice, too, that, yeah, you're right, that it's, uh, no indie developer, no large company is going to say, well, the real money is in making new Super Nintendo games for the Super Nintendo. <laughs> but this is a very large hobby, and this is the internet, so there are people that will pay good money for new hardware in that sense. Yeah. You know, uh, to get the game cart for uh, 40 Winks, you are going to be paying like full retail price. I believe it's $45 for uh, for the game cart only of 40 Winks. If you want box and all the other stuff, I think it's upwards of $100. Yeah. But if people want that hardware and are able to, to pay it, well, we do. And it's kind of nice when th th these are the... Uh, the, the, the good points, the, the good things to point to in a Kickstarter or the concept of crowdfunding where you're like, look at what we can make doing this. We can make new independent titles. We can make beginnings of new franchises. And we can also make kind of niche ideas because with the right amount of publicity, the people who will buy into that niche will do it. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, also, like, talking about a company like WayForward, which we mentioned earlier, I totally forgot they made DuckTales Remastered, which I recently bought on Steam because mm -hmm. I didn't know it was available on Steam. Otherwise, I would have bought it sooner. And I've been playing it. And first of all, it's a perfect love letter to the original game, so much so that I have to play it on easy because anything above easy and I want to throw my controller across the room. I think but, I still got my DuckTales chops. But, but the thing that's really interesting about WayForward is... With the Shante series, you know, they probably could have pushed for getting some kind of larger developer to get behind them to, or, or publisher to support them, but instead going to Kickstarter and directly connecting with fans to make those games. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if they tried to get the license for other Disney, you know, Nintendo games and try and remaster them in the future or something like that. Because I think it's just, you create a bond with the purchaser through kickstarter that as long as you're honest and do your due diligence you could create a bond for life in the same way that nintendo has more or less branded the brains of a lot of our peers because they've just been so uh fan focused or or purchaser focused yeah absolutely and it's and it's interesting to see which companies and which franchises seem to make sense for a kickstarter yeah shantae is a series that is I don't know exactly how to put it. It's almost like very, very popular indie in, yeah. a, in a sense of like a lot of people. T we last episode, we mentioned Beyond Good and Evil. A lot of people know what a great game Beyond Good and Evil is. Who bought the game when it first came out? Shantae was a fantastic Game Boy Color title that came out after the Game Boy Advance had already been released. And, and so... Anybody who played it loved it and really talked it up, but it didn't have a very large print run and it didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, it didn't have a lot of numbers. And I think it's been chasing after that same feeling ever since. The other releases are fan freaking tastic games. They really are. I love them so much. Half Genie Hero is a lot of fun. Pirate's Curse is uh, superlative. It's great. Um, but I think even as many great games as Way Forward has made, there's still that sense of like, but do you want more Shantae? We're gonna need some help. We gotta make sure that this is going to sell. If 
you know, Square Enix needs crowdfunding for Final Fantasy. I don't think anyone's going to pay into it. No. Well, because and, and some companies have done that. Some companies have tried to fund big titles on Kickstarter and and people cry wolf. I remember Zach Braff was trying to fund uh, a film, which makes sense because even though Zach Braff is a well-known actor, it doesn't mean he's rich uh, per se. But a lot of people perceived it that way. Like, you're a famous actor. You're in all this stuff. Why the hell should we be kickstartering your movie when you have all this money? And the reality is the relationship of creator and and people who want the creations isn't always clear depending on where the background is starting from. You know, if Nintendo tried to kickstarter a game, nobody would support it. Uh, right. I, w- I won't say nobody, but a lot of people would be skeptical because they're like, you're Nintendo. Why are you on Kickstarter? You're one of the biggest companies in gaming. You should not be kickstartering a game. Yeah. And the the inherent unspoken agreement in Kickstarter is it is all a risk. Yeah, and it's a risk for everybody. It's it is. A risk it's for a, it, the creators and those buying from the creators. Exactly. And there's almost that feeling of, well, you know, EA is just going to churn out another uh, game that they can use as a tap for money. And, you know, Nintendo is just going to make more of the properties they have. But there, there's this sort of like in the back of your head argument of, is this what it takes for larger companies to take risks? But the the price of that is a little too high and a little too steep to to take on and agree with sure and i mean uh, part of kickstarter that i think some people don't understand when those people get i like nobody likes to lose money at the end of the day right. nobody likes to lose money and i get that but kickstarter is an investment it's not a guarantee none of it's a guarantee and that's i'm sure in the very long terms that nobody reads that it's an investment system. You're investing in these companies, these games, these products. And if they're successful, you will get them, you know, or if you're investing in a TV show or a YouTube series or whatever it is. Right. Like there's no guarantee of a return on investment. That's what investing is. It's a gamble. You know, that's the whole point. And I think that might be why I'm not as into Kickstarter is because I'm not so into investing my money and stuff and that's fine. But I think, the people who go into Kickstarter expecting the product, no matter what, are fooling themselves a little bit. You have to go in with a little bit of understanding that it's a game of chance and that if something happens with the prod- project, if they go bankrupt, if something tanks or whatever, or like the, the the indie studio gets set on fire, like these are all things, you know, the last one being a lot less likely, I suppose. Uh, these are things that can go wrong that could be outside your investment parameters that you can't control. Yeah, and those who go about investing in larger ideas, you know, venture capitalists and investors that put a great deal of money behind things that, you know, that fund publishers and whatever else, they already have that understanding because this is what they're doing. But it's also a thing to look at, you know, if somebody with millions of dollars invests $50,000 into a company versus some of us who are just kind of we only have so much disposable income and I put $150 into getting the deluxe version of that game because I believed in this. It's interesting to maybe compare the percentage of what you could spare. Right. As well as, yeah, for some people, this is your first investment. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. And I'm sure if I saw a Kickstarter game that really hooked me or that I really believed in, that I would probably invest in it. I mean, hell, uh, outside of the parameters here, um, when Nintendo very recently announced that they're remaking Link's Awakening uh, on the Switch, that's something I'd throw my money at, that I already want to throw my money at. So, like, it really depends on the interest level of, like, again, now having played the DuckTales remastered, if WayForward said they were going to do a Chip and Dale or Darkwing Duck remastered, I would throw my money at that game so fast because I'm so happy with their previous work. I think it really comes down to perspective and you know what you're looking for and what you're investing in. And also, if you like taking risks, some people don't like to take risks. It's why they buy games months or years after they've come out or because they don't buy a new console right away because they don't think it'll work right, which is often the case. Uh, you know, people people are just not always risk takers. And I think that's the difference also between Kickstarter and something like Indiegogo and other ones where 
you get the money regardless of how much you raise. You know, you could take it out in, 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 in phases and you just get the money. If you meet your goal, great. But if you don't, you still get what's invested. Kickstarter doesn't work that way. It either gets funded or it doesn't. And if it doesn't get funded, everyone gets their money back, I believe. And yes. it just it goes away. Well, it actually you don't you you don't get charged for your uh your pledge uh-huh. until the end of the the pledging period. If right, it's until like the campaign. Thir- yeah, if for, for like thirty days in a campaign, if you on day one invest a hundred dollars, you do not get charged that hundred dollars until the end of the campaign. When it's like okay, we've met our our crowdfunding goal. Great, now you pay a hundred dollars. If it doesn't reach it. You never pay anything. Right. And then, but then if it does reach it, there's, they have, there are very few rules that insist they have to give the money back after that. I mean, mm-hmm. most companies, if they don't live up to what they're supposed to, or it's within their capacity to refund you if things don't work out, they will. They try to, but, yeah. But, but they don't have to because, again, it's an investment. Um, yeah. I, th- I think Kickstarter something an iteration of it at least will be around for a while because I think people really do crave that direct connection. I mean, think about music services like Bandcamp, which there's still a go between, but you know, it's definitely more direct to the artist Mm -hmm. than a lot of other places. Um, People want to give their money directly to people. I mean, artists that I support that I've met in person several times, if I have the opportunity to give them a $20 bill for their physical CD in person, I will do that. Oh yeah. I want to, um, you know, it's why like when we were at MAGFest, I, I visited so many vendors that even though I didn't really have a ton of spending money, if I had, if I were to spend any money, I wanted to go into the hands of someone directly that was benefiting from it because that's my favorite way to support people because otherwise so many other avenues have so many go-betweens. But I think Kickstarter is a nice uh, support system for that kind of mentality if you want to support things before they've even come out. Yeah, and and it's and it is still you know sort of pre-ordering, but it's it's in a sense of I am helping making this happen. When when you kickstart a game and it comes out and you have it in your hands finally, you know whenever bl- the my Switch copy of Bloodstained Ritual of the Night arrives at my home, and I can hold it in my hands, <laughs> there there is a thing of I contributed to this. I made this thing happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. I didn't do tons and tons of it. I might have paid for, you know, a couple of hours of one guy's shift one day. But it take it takes uh you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but you know, we filled the bucket, damn it. Yeah. I mean I, I think also after the fact, you know, companies if they were to return to Kickstarter for new games like if I had known about Shovel Knight when it was being kickstarted, I probably would have supported it. But now having played it and all the subsequent campaigns, which are each one is better than the last, uh, which is why I'm so excited about King of Cards because I know it's just going to be amazing. Mm-hmm. If Yacht Club Games goes back to Kickstarter for their next new game or sequel to Shovel Knight, you know, or whatever, I'd be way more inclined to invest after having seen the first product and being in love with it you know it takes a lot to invest in something you know nothing about you know shovel knight and yacht club games while it looked like stuff that we were familiar with it was their first game yes at, it at was to, to my knowledge and so it's harder to invest in something like that and i give a lot of people credit for investing and believing in something like that where something like mighty number no. nine or bloodstained like the creators have a legacy. So even though they haven't made this game before, they've made many other games. And so I feel like it's easier for them to get money. Like the Double Fine uh, adventure game, which ended up being, I believe, Psychonauts 2, they've officially finally announced. Um, that game was funded over a million dollars in like 24 hours and, and ended up making over $3 million when I think the goal was like, I don't know, either a million or or... 900,000 or something like that. I don't remember what the original goal was, but it definitely was not as much as they made. But people love Double Fine and Tim Schafer, and he's, you know, he's essentially one of the indie heroes who's been around for ages. And so, of course, when he goes to Kickstarter, people are going to flood to support him. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, and, and, it's, and well, and that game was also, actually, the, the crowdfunding game was uh, was Broken Age. Oh, that's right. And that's it, right. Was a po- it was like, Tim Schafer wants to bring you a new point-and-click adventure. It's like, you know, uh, Igorashi wants to bring you a new uh, Castlevania game. Right. Yeah, shut up and take my money. 
<laughs> exactly. And I think that goes a long way. And if creators step outside the big business to do that, that's fine. Like if Suda51 went to Kickstarter to make his new game and was no longer working with whatever big publisher he's currently working with, I think he's at EA. I don't remember. Um, I would absolutely support him because I love his previous work. And I think, I think it also gives a lot of gamers the ability to be fans of developers. Things that was harder to do, I think, when we were growing up because there wasn't the access. We know these names now. We know these creators. And we want to support them as directly as possible the same way we would support a writer, a filmmaker, anything like that. And I think there's a sense of camaraderie when we get to do that. Yeah, and because the teams are so large, it's... You know, it's one thing to put money directly in the hands of a writer or a small band. It's another to, you know, to give money to a ska band or an orchestra, <laughs> which yeah. is kind of what we're doing. But we want to support all of their efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as always, we're curious about your thoughts on Kickstarter. Um, I myself have never kickstarted a video game. I don't know that I've kickstarted anything. I've Indiegogo'd a few things. Like I helped a friend's... Uh, silly sci-fi youtube show get off the ground and some other things um but i don't i don't think i've really ever kickstarted anything if i have it's not a lot um so i'm always curious what people have kickstarted if you're listening and you have kickstarted games what games why did you support them what interested you about them or if you don't use kickstarter at all and hate it why it's a perfectly reasonable perspective because you know it does shift the gaming industry and maybe you're not a fan of that let us know that those ideas and comments as well somewhere on the internet because we like to hear your thoughts on these topics yes please let us know your highs your lows and your thoughts this is a conversation thank you for keeping it going i'm jeff moonen and i'm matt aka stormageddon and happy gaming